Well, we're going to start off with a little bit of what we did on Wednesday, which was talk about how big this universe gets very quickly. And I think this is often why this subject gets intimidating, because you can put molecules together in many different ways to make something different. To me, as a chemist, that's great, because I'll never be unemployed. I'll always be able to make something different that hopefully is useful, all right? By just simply putting these different pieces together. And we had a look at this chart, and we said that um, at the bottom end of this, when you don't have many atoms to play with, you're not going to get many isomers. In fact, the, the lower sort of alkanes here, CH4, C2H6, C3H8, you can only make one possible isomer by putting those atoms together to make an alkane. But that starts to change with C4, C5, C6, and you end up with C40, which again, in, in the bigger context, is not a big molecule. Right? The engineers will have to build, deal with bigger molecules like polymers, and the biologists will have to deal with things like proteins, which are huge. They contain hundreds and hundreds of atoms. Uh, but if you want to put together simply 40 carbons, 82 hydrogens, you have a huge number of possibilities for how that can happen. That's why the subject gets so big so quickly, because of the possibility of isomerism. Uh, we talked a little bit about drawing these things. You've got to be careful. You really have to be on your toes here, not to repeat yourself. If you start repeating yourself, uh, you start to lose credit. And recognize that, if, for example, at the bottom, these two molecules are the same thing, even though they've turned slightly. And that's really what we do today in Chapter 4, is talk about looking at a molecule from different angles and getting information from it, deciding upon whether the molecule is more stable or less stable, depending upon its shape, but it still is the same molecule. You have to do chemistry to change the molecule. We're not doing any chemistry in Chapter 4. We're not breaking any bonds. We're not making any bonds. So these pictures are something you can practice, uh, ask in office hours, ask in recitation, and uh, make sure we're comfortable with them so we can get further on. Now, little idea about chemistry. This is the only reaction you really see in this chapter. This is the combustion of alkanes. Uh, most of you probably drove to school today and you did this reaction. You took gasoline and you uh, burnt it and you got energy out and you were able to propel your vehicle. You can see here uh, the first of a, a series of charts that you have to be comfortable with throughout both semesters. And this is looking at the relative stabilities of different things, right? They're all isomeric. They all contain the same number of carbons, the same number of hydrogens. And if we combust them, we can look at the same products. In both cases, or in each case, we get eight molecules of CO2 and nine molecules of H2O. You should have seen this type of idea before. You should have seen this in freshman chemistry, the idea of energy being given off when you combust an alkane. So we get release of a certain amount of energy. Uh, we'll talk about kilojoules. I was raised on kilocalories that, you know, divide one by four, you get the other. Uh, we'll talk about relative sizes. Do you have to know these numbers? Not necessarily. You have to know why they are the size they are. You have to know the relative sizes based on some of the factors we'll talk about, but you don't need to memorize the numbers. Uh, there is a difference in their stabilities depending upon their structures. We describe the top one up here as being straight chains. That one is a straight chain, and that one really is the least stable of the lot. And you think about what um, gasoline is, it's mostly octane. And if you think about nomenclature from the other day, that molecule is straight octane. That's all it is. That's what you can bust when you're, you're burning petrol. Uh, you can see now it gives us a certain amount of energy to go down to these products. Uh, you can see now that if you start to put branches in, you get less energy out. And that tells you a couple of things. It tells you that this molecule is more stable because it's lower on our scale. And also it's maybe not as useful as a petroleum because it's not going to give you as much energy. Uh, you can see now that you get less energy given out. And if you go to the fully branched alkane, you get even less energy out. So we're starting to talk now about relative stabilities versus relative reactivities. This is the most stable, and therefore the least reactive. On the far left, you have the most reactive, the one that contains the most energy and releases that when it's combusted. Uh, we don't really know the factors here why this is the case. We don't know about radicals just yet. We will later on. But basically, if you break this thing apart, it gives you more stable pieces. We don't know why just yet, but later on we will. So a branched alkane is going to be more stable than a straight chain alkane for future reference. Now. Uses of these things, you all use these things every day. The economy is still very much based on petroleum and petroleum products. And companies, when they get this stuff out of the ground, will do their best to use up every single part of that um, material. And when you get crude oil, and you think about what crude oil is, you have to purify it. And often this is a, a process called distillation. You will do distillations in the lab yourself in the near future. And this is how you fractionate and get the different fractions out of crude oil. Uh, if you ever go past a... a um, a refinery, say down on the Gulf Coast or on, on, on one of the, um, uh, in, in Europe, they, t they tend to be on the, uh, the British Northeast where my sister lives, and you'll see that the fractionator, there's usually a flame at the top. They're usually burning off the very lowest material that they don't want. They haven't got no use, they have no use for it, so they burn it off, and that's what the flame's about. And you can see now that um, if you start boiling these things and doing distillations, you can collect what we call fractions, and you can come up with different collections of different pieces. You can call, you know, think about C1 versus C4, 
Uh, lots of use for natural gas, obviously. That's been a big deal around here over the last few years. Uh, petrochemicals and plastics. Those require small fragments, small alkanes. So that's where they would go to. But you have to separate them, so this is why the process is expensive. Uh, you move up to things like C5 through C12, you're looking at gasoline. Uh, in the lab, you'll use hexane, pentane, stuff like that. They are solvents. They're just useful for dissolving up organic materials. And then you start to get into the higher boiling fractions, and you head into some sort of uh, really, really useful kerosene for heating in the winter and jet fuel. Okay? So each of these fractions are then, dis are, are then distilled, separated, and then sold off as, uh, you know, different, uh, for different requirements. Uh, as you get higher and higher, we did say that uh, even alkanes, which have sort of weak intermolecular forces, they can become solids. And you think about what's been happening on uh, Belmont or Fifth Avenue over in the recent days, they've been re resurfacing it, right? So that's all based on this sort of thing, asphalt, which is a byproduct of the petroleum industry. So it all goes to use, right? There's very little waste here um, because it's so expensive. Now, the engineers might be involved in the process at the bottom, which is called cracking. And this is a thermal process in which you take higher alkanes, such as this one here, and basically you heat it very high under a hydrogen atmosphere. And what that does, under fairly rational conditions that we'll worry about later, the chemistry is, is complicated and we're not there yet, you get breaking of those pieces. So that's useful because you can take the higher material, which might not be of much use, and break it into smaller pieces, which then could be sold off as solvents or petroleum. So those types of things are useful. You don't know anything about the chemistry yet. We will later. Uh, we'll keep an eye on that for now. But alkanes are very important. They are the feedstock, really, for the chemical industry, and they help us uh, get, to, you know, get to school and back. Where I turn to now is the big thing for the exam. It is the, what I think is the most complicated stuff from Chapter 4. If you get yourself through acids, through acids and bases in Chapter 3, you're in good shape. Uh, chapter 4, there's a lot of stuff here, so don't leave it to the last minute. But it is the foundation of things like structural biology. If you think about how people know how to mimic a drug or how to mimic a compound in nature and how to form a pharmaceutical, it's often based on analysis of shapes and analysis of the lowest energy possibilities for a molecule relaxing itself. And this is nothing more complicated than standing up or sitting down. If you were forced to stand up for my 50-minute class, you'd probably be a bit annoyed, yeah? And you'd be tired. So that would be a high-energy system. Uh, if you sit down, you're comfortable. You can fall asleep if you want. I'll wake you up. Uh, but you're more relaxed when you're sitting down. So we'll talk about high energy, low energy, being relaxed and not being relaxed as we go. And I just bring in this slide, this is just FYI, you don't need to copy it down, uh, talking about why this is so important, for example, in pharmaceutical chemistry in pharmacy. The idea that we have uh, the possibility to mimic natural compounds. You think about uh, HIV has been a big problem over the past 30 years. Uh, we have some drugs out there now that are very good at, uh, at inhibiting this compound and, and, and uh, inhibiting this virus and essentially killing it. Uh, thymidine, you've all seen that if you've taken genetics or basic biology, it's one of the alphabet T, it's the alphabet uh, letter from, um, is it RNA or DNA? It's DNA, isn't it? Now, that's a naturally occurring compound, and you need that, and the virus needs that to replicate itself, to grow. So, what chemists did was take this molecule and say, okay, that hydroxyl there is essential for function. It's essential as a linker, so the molecule or the, the virus can build its uh, DNA. Well, AZT is either thymidine, or otherwise known as zydovudine, is a very simple modification. And I bring in N3 because it's, it's my favorite group, it's what we do in my research lab. N3 replaces the OH group, we make a synthetic compound in the lab, the virus doesn't know any better. The virus picks this stuff up, doesn't know any better, and all of a sudden you can't link to that N3. And so you stop the chain from growing. Now you can't do this sort of randomly, that's how it was done in the past, but these days with computers and, and all this sort of uh, memory you can use to do calculations, you can work out the shape of this thing, and you can work out the shape of this thing. And if they're close, there's a very good chance that it will work as a drug. Okay, there's a lot more to that, but that's the beginning. So what we'll do now in chapter four is this first look at what's called conformational analysis. What does a molecule really look like? And when it relaxes, what's its lowest energy state? And if it can rotate, what are the possibilities of, of that? So we need to introduce some pictures, some different ways of looking at organic molecules. And if you've got Chem3D or ChemDraw, uh, this will be useful, you can do this at home. If you've already downloaded ChemDraw, and it was a while back, go and try it again, because now you have the whole thing. You have the Chem3D as well. And you can start making these molecules, and it helps, to see, helps you see uh, what they look like. So we have seen recently this idea of wedges and dashes. We know that the wedge means, what does that mean? What does that wedge mean? Coming out towards us, uh, the dash is going in, and the straight lines are in the plane. I'll be saying a lot of that soon, right? In the plane. And we can think of that as a nice representation of a 3D molecule on a flat piece of paper or on a slide. 
Well, we have to understand that we can move these things around in space, and we can even move within the molecule. Every single bond can rotate, so that will lead to possible, possibly different shapes. Uh, we'll talk about sawhorse very briefly. It's not used so very much because these have overtaken them, but all we've done here is turn that molecule on its side. And we can see at the front we have a CH3 group, and the back we have a CH3 group. And that gives us some idea now of the relative disposition of atoms on adjacent carbons. That's what this next part of this chapter is about, is looking at the orientation of groups two carbons away. Well, we can take that even further and turn it on its end, and this was developed at Ohio State by Melvin Newman. Uh, he passed away uh, when I was in graduate school down there. He was a, a superb chemist, and every sophomore organic chemist across the planet knows who he is, because uh, he invented the Newman projection. And you have to worry about these things because they're useful. We see now that this thing has been turned on its end, so we can look at this thing from the front and strip out some of the information. What we're looking for here is the relationship between the red hydrogen here and the blue hydrogen there. And what is the angle between them? That's really the, the discussion today. And what does that angle tell you about relative stability? And when you start putting bigger groups onto these carbons, how does that affect the shape of the molecule? What does it look like in reality? If you know what it looks like in reality, you can design things to mimic it. So we'll spend a lot of time talking about Newman's today. And then Monday, we'll get into the six-membered rings and we'll talk about cyclohexanes. But I want to introduce a couple of different ways of looking at organic molecules because you have to keep on your toes. What we've done so far is we've done our best to strip out as much information as possible so we can communicate quickly. If you look at that, CH, you know, that butane right there with four carbons, when we first started this subject, all the hydrogens were in there, all the bonds, all the electrons were in there for Lewis dot structures, and we stripped all that out because it's faster to do it this way. But we have to keep at the back of our mind that molecules don't look like this. They're not straight lines. They don't even look like this. For those of you who've got the models, we can talk about that in office hours and in recitation next week. They're very useful for the next few chapters. And they help you remind yourself that the world is 3D. These molecules are three-dimensional. They're not simple structures like we've drawn them. Uh, one way to draw a molecule is like that, or put it together with a plastic kit. You can see the balls represent the atoms and the lines represent the bonds. But even that isn't very good. That's not adequate. What is much better is this, what we call a space filling model. And you can really only do this on the computer. The space filling model gives you an idea of what that molecule looks like to another molecule approaching it. And since most of what we have to do in the two semesters is worry about chemistry when molecule A approaches molecule B, these space filling models help you out a great deal. Because you can see now it's volumes of electron density. We're not little spheres at the end of sticks. We're talking about volumes of electron density and where atoms are, so that this thing here is a much better representation of that system. So what I need to do today is to introduce the Newman depiction and talk a little bit about how to use it and then how to study it so you understand the, the uh, inferences here. So what I've got, hopefully here, are some models. And you can build these very easily on ChemDraw or Chem3D, and then we can start to use them. Uh, I'm going to look at, first off, ethane, which I made earlier. There's ethane, CH3CH3. All you have to do is type, use the alphabet thing here, type in ethane, and you get ethane. Or you can build it from scratch if you want. You can move it around easily enough. You can see how it's uh, sort of orientated in space. And we can talk about relative dispositions of atoms. I can use this arrow here to point at certain atoms. I can highlight things if I want to. And then I can have a conversation about the relative orientations. Well, a lot of what we'll do today is turning this molecule on its end like that. There's your Newman depiction. There's maybe the sort of wedge dash depiction. Maybe there's a sawhorse depiction. There is the Newman depiction. So we've got to be careful here because Newman has suggested with his very clever, as most you know, brilliant ideas usually are very simple, let's ignore the back carbon. We're not interested in that back carbon. We're interested in what's attached to it. So look at this. If I turn this slightly, that back carbon, this atom here, is still there. But in the Newman depiction, you cover it. And now what you have are three atoms here, down to the left, down to the right, emanating from the front carbon and joining on that front carbon. And these other atoms at the back, this one here, there, and there, are attached at the back carbon. They are not attached to the front carbon. That would break the octet rule. So we've gone from a fairly detailed look with wedges and dashes, and we've turned it slightly to ignore the back carbon. And notice this atom at the back is attached to the back, not the front. So now I have a Newman depiction. Once you can see that, we can start to draw these things on paper. And it's very quick to do so, and it's very uh, elegant to be able to, to do this. Uh, what I want to do today is spend some time spinning around that central bond because we're going to talk about relative orientation. So I'm going to highlight that bond. I'm going to do something called a dihedral driver calculation, which is basically make that molecule spin. 
around that central carbon-carbon bond. And if it does so, you get a graph. And what that graph is, is relative energy of each of those shapes. As the hydrogens go past each other, they start to interfere. That's less stable. As the hydrogens get further away from each other, okay, the molecule stabilizes itself. So we can see pretty quickly a graph, which I can manipulate here. This is kind of cool. We can see how this thing is happening in space. We can see that the highest energy, maybe, is where the hydrogens are getting close to each other. And the lowest energy down here is where the hydrogens are getting far away from each other. Your job today, this weekend, is to get this into your head so you can use it for next week on the exam and understand it. So we'll get there in a minute and we'll develop those pictures and then we'll move into butane which is more complicated. So your basic Newman depiction looks like that. And there are some very easy ways to get this wrong. Okay? If you don't recognize that the circle... Morning, Michaela. If you don't recognize this, if you're not careful here, You've got to recognize that the front carbon has four things attached to it. You can't see the fourth one. You can't see the carbon at the back. But you can see three atoms joined to it at the front. So the red hydrogens are at the front, and the blue hydrogens are at the back. Some things that people will do by mistake is they will draw a circle, they'll do that, and they'll forget what this is all about. And what's the problem with that? You've got way too many bonds. You're breaking all kinds of rules. Okay? So that's how you don't do it. This is how you do do it. More atoms at the back, one of which you can't see. The other atoms are pointing towards you. At the back, you have our hydrogens, which are pointing away. So this is your basic um, Newman depiction. As it says at the bottom, concentrating on one particular bond axis. Now is a good time to get into the old exams. There's at least three or four years worth of old exam ones out there with answer keys that you can be practicing for next week. You're never going to see the same questions, but you get the same idea for the style of the exam. One of my favorite questions to ask with this stuff is to give you a molecule name it, or I will name it, you draw it, and then you focus on a bond axis. What that means is you focus on C3 or C4, or C4 and C5. And your job is to then, in your head, orientate this thing so you can draw it on paper to explain what I'm asking for. That's not trivial at all. It takes a lot of practice. So concentrating on one bond axis here, we are concentrating on the carbon-carbon bond axis in ethane, CH3, CH3. And we're going to look now at a very simple way of discussing the relative energies of these patterns or these shapes as we spin around that axis. So here we can talk about some definitions. So I'm going to go back in a second, recreate that graph, and you'll see where this comes from, and then we'll look at the graph in the textbook, and hopefully they'll be the same. And we need to talk about some definitions. This is called confirmation analysis, because we're changing the shape, the confirmation of the molecule. It's basically we're standing up or sitting down. That's a confirmational change. And we have to have some terms here to describe relative orientations of stuff at the front versus stuff at the back. So at the front, I've got this one. It's bonded to the front, that's how you can tell. At the back, I've got this one. How do you know it's bonded at the back? It stops there, right? You don't complete that line because that would give a bond extra to the front, that would be illegal. So I have an angle between these bonds, and we'll call that the dihedral angle. In this case, it's 60. What is the angle between this one at the top and this one at the bottom? 180. Right? So we'll talk about those angles. There's nothing tricky here. It's very simple uh, geometry, if you like. Well, we'll say that this also belongs to a family of structures called staggered conformations. Staggered is just obvious, right? Everything is staggered. Nothing is on top of each other. In this case, this is not on top of this, and this is not on top of that. And when the angle is 60 degrees around the, cycle, around the circle, everything is 60 degrees. This is said to be uh, staggered. We'll start rotating, I'll do that graph again in a second, and we'll find that in certain instances, atoms start to overlap. Now, there's a bit of a compromise here. Newman realized that if you drew an absolute overlapping, you couldn't see the stuff at the back, because it would be eclipsed, and that's where the word comes from. So what he did was offset it a little bit, to, to suggest that this atom at the front is on top of this atom at the back. They're going to start getting closer to each other. That's going to be a problem. That would be a destabilizing interaction. As you change these hydrogens for bigger groups, that problem gets worse. So you'll start to see the graph change in terms of the structures um, in a little bit. So this is called eclipsed, simply because things are on top of each other. And that usually is the highest energy situation. And you think now, you're, doing, you're going around a circle. You're doing 360 degrees around a circle. You've got pieces that are far away from each other, all of a sudden getting close to each other, and then going far away from each other. You're going to go from a minimum to a maximum, back to a minimum as you go through that rotation. So with that in mind, let's talk about this graph. You need to be able to reproduce these things. You need to be able to think about what they are. 
you can do it from scratch if you understand what's going on. You don't have to memorize this stuff at all. If you understand it, you can do it from scratch. So what is happening here is we are starting off in a situation in which ethane, CH3, CH3, is the simplest example. We're, we're focusing on those two hydrogens. We could focus on any of the hydrogens front and back. We're just focusing on these because they're red. And we are rotating around this bond. So what's happening here, if you look, is we are leaving maybe the back carbon where it is and rotating the front carbon so that the red hydrogen is going in this direction. And this is important. You've got to keep things as simple as you possibly can when you're dealing with difficult stuff like this. Don't overcomplicate it. When you do a Newman depiction, you leave one carbon where it was. And it's up to you which one you do. You leave the front where it is and you rotate the back or the other way around. Do not rotate both at the same time or it just goes wrong very quickly. It's impossible to use then. Keep one of those carbons where it is, rotate the other one relative to the front one, and you can do all you need to do. So we've got rotation here, where the red hydrogen, the, the bond here seems to be rotating, the red hydrogen seems to be coming this direction, it's becoming eclipsed with the one at the back, that's why it went up in energy. I'll show you these structures in a second with the Chem 3D, it's not difficult. If this goes further, leave the back where it was, bring that hydrogen down here, obviously all the other hydrogens have to go in this direction too because they're attached, they can't just sit there and ignore this, we now end up with a situation where this is next to this. Okay? But because we're all hydrogens, we're back to the same situation, really. We have a hydrogen 60 degrees from an H, 60 degrees from an H, all the way around, which is the same as where we were. That's why the energy here is the same. Keep doing this, and keep dragging this hydrogen across. It will go past another hydrogen, that's why it's eclipsed. And then keep going, it will come back down, and it will end up like that. So you do this for 360 degrees, you get this curve in which all the minima are the same, and all the maxima are the same, because we're only, only dealing with hydrogens. All the interactions are equivalent, whether they're unstable or stable. What you should get from that graph, that eclipsing is unstable, or less stable than down here, which is when everything's staggered. Staggered's good, eclipsing is bad. Now, don't forget, this is a curve. So as you go up this curve, this means something. There will be a shape at each point on that curve. And that will be as you go from 0 through every single degree to get to 60, and then every single degree to get to 120 and whatever. So there are an infinite number of possibilities here for these shapes. So what I'm going to try and do now is go back to my Chem 3D and see if we can see where this comes from. Okay, what I've done so far is I've taken my molecule of ethane, I've turned it on its end to show you the Newman depiction, and I've turned it on its side to show you where the wedge dash came from. So I'm going to do this in two different ways. There's from the side, so you can see the back atom. And I've focused on this bond here. What do I do? How do I do that? I take this cursor here, and I focus on that atom, and that tells the computer what to focus on. I'm going to take calculation, dihedral driver, and do a single angle plot around that. It will give me the output of a 360 degree rotation around that carbon-carbon bond. It does it quite quickly, but then we can focus on this by going onto the graph. That graph looks the same as the one we just saw, right? It's the same idea. So if you look at this, we're starting down there, and all of a sudden, if I go up here, I get a higher situation, a higher energy situation. Down at the bottom, it's said to be staggered. In other words, all the hydrogens are as far away from po as each other as possible. I can prove that by turning this molecule, if you like, and draw showing it from the front. There's the staggered conformation, where everything is 60 degrees away from each other, front and back. That's down here. Now, if I start to rotate, you can see one atom stays where it is. In this case, the back atom is moving. And why is it going higher in energy? Things are starting to get close to each other. Atoms are starting to get into each other's space. And so that destabilizes the situation. Now, the absolute, you know, the pure eclipse conformation looks like that. But that doesn't tell you very much as a chemist trying to read this on a piece of paper. So Newman decided, OK, let's compromise and let's have an offset. So that's the eclipse right there. So that you can see all the atoms. And the idea now is that the front and the back are overlapping. They're getting closer to each other. So what I can try and do here is turn this around and you can see now that they are getting closer to each other, right? They're getting close in space. Well, that doesn't look very close in space. So what I can do now is go to uh, structure. Uh, let's see, what is it? Structure, measurements. Where am I? View, model display, display mode, space filling. Let's turn this into a real picture, right? Those atoms are very close to each other. They don't look like that when you have the ball and stick in front of you, the little model, but once you make the 3D thing, they're close to each other. And if you want to change this again, look at that. They get further away from each other. 
They get close to each other like that. You certainly can see interactions with these atoms at the top and these atoms down here. And if you rotate this in the other direction and you go away from each other, I argue that that atom is getting further away from this one and it's further away from that one. So it works. Obviously, you can't draw those things all the time. So I'm going to go back to the ball and stick representation, which is easier to use. Once you get this, it's not difficult. So if I go to this, what type of depiction is that? Is that eclipsed or staggered? It's eclipsed. I can't see it so well in that type of picture. That's why we use the Newman depiction. Look at that. They're on top of each other. That's a bad situation. I can alleviate that problem by rotating. By rotating means dragging the cursor in this direction, maybe. And things start to get better because those atoms start to get away from each other. And I can go back down to another minimum in which they are completely staggered like so, and everything's away from each other. Now, you've got to, be, you've got to remember, you can't stop bonds from rotating. You can't freeze a molecule out. It's always happening. So you've got to be concerned here with the fact that this is always happening. So what does the molecule look like? Well, you get an average. You get a very much like a curve in a class. You get an average. And most molecules look like the best situation where the, the, uh, the, the strain is alleviated or the energy is minimized. But some of them have high energy. Some of them have low energy. It's an average. And we'll deal with that when we get to the chemistry side of things. But right now, recognize that any molecule that just has single bonds can do this. You can get free rotation throughout those bonds. Anybody want to say anything? Ashley. Uh, there'd have to be something extraordinary happening for that to happen. In this chapter, no. In this chapter, staggered is going to be better. So I'm going to go back to my slides. I'm going to continue this in terms of uh, how you apply it, because it's fun and it's easy when you have a computer in front of you. But guess what on the exam? You won't have a computer in front of you. You have to draw these things. You have to read them and interpret them. So what we just did was try to persuade you that rotation around 360 degrees in this molecule gives you different shapes. Some of those shapes are better than others because of things like overlap. Moving on. There is a cost to pay when one hydrogen goes past the other. You have, you have to pay a price. And if you add this whole thing up, about three hydrogens going past each other, it turns out the total cost is about 12 kilojoules per mole. That's about, th th it's about three kilocalories per mole. So what does that mean in reality? It means it's, it's a significant amount of energy to do this. A hydrogen bond is worth about 3 kcals per mole. If hydrogen bonding is important, then this is important because it's about the same in terms of its energy. This rotation around ethane is about the same energy as, as a hydrogen bond. So we need to be concerned about uh, why staggered is so good and why eclipse is so bad. I think it's fairly obvious that if things are getting in each other's way, that's a destabilizing interaction. But you will read the textbook over the weekend. Yes, you will. And you'll notice that there is a, a more modern discussion of why the staggered seems to be preferred these days. This is fairly recent. If you look at things when they're staggered, here's a CH bond and here's a CH bond. And they're staggered. And in fact, when they're pointing in opposite directions and staggered. We haven't said much about the antibond just yet. But now we can start to think about this. If you think about a pi bond, in a pi bond, you have two p orbitals. What direction must they be pointing to overlap? The same. They must be parallel. Yes? So that's a good thing. If you have two orbitals that are parallel, they can communicate, they can give you bonding. Same argument here. If your two orbitals are parallel, and that's only possible if they're staggered like this, and they can talk to each other. You can have the anti-bonding situation of one orbital talking to the bonding situation of the other orbital. You get a little bit of extra bonding. The argument is that that helps stabilize a staggered situation. So this is partly to do with this, and it's partly to do with size and things overlapping. And it's partly to do with strain. So it is a fairly complicated argument about you know, why staggered is so good and why eclipse is so bad. And we have to be conversant with this and comfortable with it. So we've talked a little bit about uh, things trying to pass each other. That will destabilize something. And we're talking now about why this, the, the anti situation is so good because of this extra overlap. Well, we can do this with higher alkanes. You're going to have to worry about things like butane and molecules of similar structure, which have different groups attached. If you go to propane, and I can do this again very quickly on the uh, molecule here, I can get rid of all this junk, I can go to my model, and I can make propane. So this was ethane with two carbons attached. If I want to make propane, I'm going to turn this around slightly, I'm going to take my alphabet, and I'm going to type on here CH3. Because that gives me propane. And I'm going to focus on one of those two carbon-carbon bonds. And I'm going to hopefully get a graph from that by doing this. And it's the same graph. 
So moving to propane makes no difference whatsoever. And that should become fairly obvious, because if you think about rotation of this piece at the back, you have the same interactions regardless of where you are, because you're dealing with just hydrogens. You have a hydrogen passing a methyl, you have a hydrogen passing a hydrogen. You have the same interactions. So I start down here, and I go up. We have hydrogens eclipsing at the bottom. We have a hydrogen eclipsing a methyl. And we come down, and we get back to really where we were. And you go back up here, and that shape really is the same as the one at the beginning, or uh, uh, the, the other maximum. It's the same as this shape. That shape there is the same as this shape here. And if you go over here, the shape is the same. So the point is the interactions are very similar to those in ethane. It's only when you move to something like butane that things start to get more complicated. And butane is the one you spend most of your time worrying about because it does exemplify other more complicated molecules. So propane, same graph. Not much interest there. Butane, woof. Butane is where it starts to get quite complicated. All of a sudden, we have a situation now where the maxima are not the same and the minima are not the same. That's going to be really important. That's going to be what differentiates passing and failing here. We have, at the top, an eclipse situation, which is terrible. And at the bottom, we have some staggered situations, which are better, but are no, no longer equivalent. If you go back to where we were with my molecules, and I look at this again, I go to here. This is butane. All I've done, like you did in the lab down in, in the first experiment over there, was draw the molecule like this and then do some manipulations. Carbon 1, carbon 2, carbon 3, carbon 4. Which bond axis am I focusing on here? C2, C3. For those of you who've seen past exams, that's the, that's the direction. That's what you're looking for. Make sure you're in the right place. And I'm going to do uh, something called a minimization to make sure this thing is as cool as it can be. There it is, good. And then I'm going to do my rotation. I'm going to do calculations, dihedral driver, single angle plot. Notice that one carbon stayed where it was, and the other carbon moved. That's absolutely essential to be able to do this properly. What I get now is a graph that looks somewhat similar to the one that was in the book. And I can think about the orientations here. I'm here right now. I start to rotate. I get to a local maximum. Because in this situation, this hydrogen is overlapping this hydrogen. Right? And then I go up again, or I go actually back down to a staggered. I'll show you this in the Newman depiction in a second. And I go back up, and all of a sudden I've got a really bad situation. Because I have a large methyl group on top of a large methyl group. You don't want that. That's the worst of the lot. And if you carry on through the 360, you come back down the other side, and you end up with a repeat of those patterns. They just happen to be mirror images. And then you get another local maximum where you get the methyl group on top of a hydrogen, and then you're back to where we started. Now, you can see that with that depiction, but it's much more useful to see it with a Newman depiction. So I'm going to go back to where I started. I'm going to turn this thing in space. You see that now. Now I can show you this in my office. I've got a, a little laptop that I can put on the, uh, the, the monitor that's on my front desk right there. And I can show you this one-on-one. -on -one. It's easy. It's straightforward once you see it. It means nothing if you, know, if you don't get it. So what have I got here? I've got a situation where at the top, I've got a methyl group. At the bottom, I've got a methyl group. And I have a front carbon that I can see, and I have a back carbon that I can't see. I'm focusing on C2 and C3. And I'm going to do my rotation again, starting there. And that's very good. Why? Because the methyl groups are as far away as they can possibly be. We'll define this in a second as something called an anti-conformation. We're going to go up. Why is it getting less stable? Because my methyl group and my hydrogen at the front are starting to interact. That will destabilize. It's not the worst it can be. That's a local maximum. As we continue across and we go through our 360 degrees, we can come back down here, and all of a sudden we have a situation which is OK, but it's not as good as where we started. Why not? The two methyl groups are getting closer. At the beginning, they were far away. Now they're getting closer. That's going to be worse. We'll call that a gauche confirmation in a second. I continue up the hill here, and all of a sudden, things are getting pretty bad. Right? At the very top, you have the two large groups over overlapping each other. That's the worst of the lot. That's the worst eclipse. And then carry on down here, you get the opposite happening. You get the mirror image, you get the mirror image, you're back to where you started. Again, I will emphasize this as often as I can. One carbon moves, the other one doesn't, or else it's impossible to do this. So I go back to my sort of uh, paper description of how this is happening, and hopefully it matches. At the bottom, we've got the best of the lot, where the methyl groups are as far away as possible from each other. That's going to be called the anti-situation. If I rotate through 360, it's not the same maximum or the same minima anymore because we have different groups attached. 
If I go up this hill, I get to this situation. Now, what is that? Eclipsed or staggered? It's an eclipsed. It's offset a little bit to make sure you can read it, but it is definitely an eclipsed situation. And then I come back down, and what would you call this? Staggered, and I would head back up, and this would be eclipsed, et cetera, et cetera. But the difference in the heights now is important, because in this situation, we have methyl overlapping H, methyl overlapping H, where in this situation, we have methyl overlapping methyl. That's worse. So we can draw this graph, and then we can start to think about uh, definitions and start to worry about what the molecules actually look like when you start to do chemistry. So from the book, I'm not that interested in this chart uh, or the numbers. It's just giving you an idea of what goes into this. If you start to think about putting methyl groups on a small molecule, they're large. They want to be away from each other. And you think about VSEPR from the first week or the first couple of days, where electrons want to be away from each other. It's a similar idea. And if you start to take angles away from their ideal situation, what happens? It becomes strained. You build in strain. If you start taking angles away from 109.5 degrees, you build in strain, because that atom wants to be 109.5, and for some reason it cannot be. So we'll talk about torsional strain, and we'll talk about steric hindrance, the idea that a molecule possibly maybe can't be ideal, and that builds in instability. And we'll talk about uh, torsional strain when we go around this cycle, atoms getting close to each other and then alleviating that by going past. There is a price to pay for doing this rotation. So don't worry about those numbers. They're not that important. But recognize this is a multi-component idea. It's not just a very one, one simple idea. What you need to be concerned with are definitions. You need to be able to draw these things quickly, accurately, and then to be able to discuss them. So at the top left, I've got the best of the lot, in which the two large groups, I'm saying methyl, but I could put whatever I want here, any large groups, this is as far away as possible from that one. That's the best situation. As you start to rotate, things start to get on top of each other. That's an eclipsed. Okay, on some of my homeworks, I might call it eclipsed one, as opposed to eclipsed two, just to give it a different label. And in this example here, I've got a different word, gauche. This is the interaction where the two large groups, whatever they may be, are 60 degrees from each other. By definition, that is a gauche interaction. So that is a staggered conformation. It's not as good as the original anti-conformation, but we now have families. Staggered are better, eclipsed are worse. Which is the worst of all four pictures right there? The last one, because the two methyl groups are on top of each other. You have to try to translate that from that graph into those pictures to talk about what the molecules will look like. And if you look at my old exams, I'll ask you, you know, Draw the worst situation for this molecule along this axis. Draw the best situation. Draw a gauche picture so that we get the definitions down so we can start to use this. So this is a combination of what we call torsional strain, which is about angles, and also steric strain in which things are getting close to each other. Staggered, good. Eclipsed, bad. That's the take home from there. Anybody? Brian. So they are happening a little bit between the hydrogens, but the hydrogens are small enough that it's not that big of a deal. As you start to go away from hydrogen, this starts to become a big deal. As things get bigger. Blahu. They go wherever you want, dude. Northern hemisphere, it's this way. The southern hemisphere, it's the other way. Wherever you want. Yeah, it's all happening. So you can extrapolate this very quickly. And this is where you need to be on top of things so it doesn't get overwhelming. You can see now that I've changed this from methyls and methyls to methyls and ethyls. Not a big change. And it won't affect the actual structure of the graph, because you still have the same types of interactions. I've got an anti here. Uh, I've got eclipsed in this case. I've got propyls here and an ethyl here. The whole point is that they are larger than hydrogen. You can put elephants, giraffes, whatever you want on these things. If they get larger, they interact. That's the whole key. And so on an exam, it's very easy to write these questions because all I have to do is change the groups. And your job is to recognize this, oh, all he's done is change the groups and get on with answering the question. Because it's the same problem every time. So we have some abbreviations. We haven't seen this necessarily. Uh, methyl, ethyl. I do this because on the, the homework and the quizzes, this starts to show up. Those are abbreviations for the abbreviations, if you like. Those are ways of drawing these things very quickly. Now, if I ask you on an exam to give me the total structure, the full structure, don't use the abbreviations. I want to see you drawing things out so I know that you know what a sec buffer group is, what a T buffer group is. You have to draw that, draw that in. But what we've developed so far is a language that we can use to describe shape. We can use to describe conformation, shape. And we can, we can now talk about which is better and which is worse uh, within those shapes. 
So examples, just to give you something to think about. The least stable conformation of 3-methylnonane along the four, C4, C5 bond. What's the first thing you would do for this? I would draw C3, I would draw 3-methylnonane. How many carbons in nonane? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Where's the methyl group? 3, right? Along C4, that's that and that. Now, what you've got to try and do here is tricky, and it is indicative of where we go after the first test into the more complicated three-dimensional stereochemical ideas. You can imagine yourself standing here. This is my physics eye, people. That's my optics eye. And I'm looking in that direction. Or you could be looking from here. It doesn't matter. All right? In this case, it says along the C4, so let's do, let's do as it says. Let's go from here, from the top. Once you've aligned that, you can see where the pieces will go. And I've got a better picture here. I've defined C4 and C5, and then I'm deciding about what shape it should be. The least stable is what? Is that an eclipse or an anti? It's eclipsed. Well, how do you extrapolate this? How do you get this quickly? If you look at my picture on the left, I can remember that I've also got hydrogens attached here. And since I've already used up my two straight lines, those hydrogens, one must be a wedge, one must be a dash to make it tetrahedral. And if I look down that bond axis now, uh, this looks like it's staggered. I've got my carbon down here, opposite to my carbon up there. That's the anti-staggered conformation. That's not what I'm asking to draw here. You don't get it, you come and ask. You ask in recitation, we work it out. You can only do so much in front of a big audience like this. Well, this requires a rotation, because that is not the least stable conformation, is it? In fact, that's the best. So I need to rotate around that bond. And that gives me this. Now, if I draw my hydrogens, two at the front and two at the back, that might help you see where this is becoming eclipsed. Because this hydrogen's on top of this one, this hydrogen's on top of that one at the back, and now my carbon groups are on top of each other. That is an eclipse situation, and that's the worst of the lot. And if I turn that into a Newman depiction, I can turn it on its side, and I'll come up with that picture. That's what we have to be able to do. It's very elegant, very clever, and when you get it, very simple, but incredibly useful. Another example, the most stable conformation of 1,1-dibromo-6-chlorohexane. What's the first thing you would do? Draw that molecule. And we can think about then thinking about the most stable. What's the most stable, the eclipsed or the, the, eclipsed or the staggered? Staggered. Is it the gauche staggered or the anti-staggered? Anti-staggered. That's where this picture comes from. That's where this picture comes from. Practice. Down at the bottom, gauche. Gauche should mean something. It should mean next door to the group at the top, if you like, or the bottom. And 5-methyl molecule, draw it, and then put those pieces together. So this is on there. This is going to be on there next week, no doubt. And it is something that you can get used to very quickly. Other example, draw the Newman depictions for each of these things. There are no pictures here. I do not give you any pictures. You must come up with the pictures. That's what's challenging. First part, highest energy, there it is, think about that, down here, <coughs> different one. By next week I'll be into cycles, you can do these same things for cycles, you can draw the Newman depictions for cycles. Turn this thing on its side, you can see orientations based on whether they are going to be anti or gauche or whatever. Down here, more complicated molecule. This is just because it's Friday, and my job on Friday as we head towards Halloween is to scare you. <laughs> into recognizing that Friday is, is your friend because it's the weekend and you can catch up, right? because you need to catch up. If you do, what, do well on this first test, after the first four weeks, which I make a break to my class, great, we'll carry on. If you don't do well on this test, like getting less than a 70, that's it. So we can extrapolate this. We can take it further. We can talk a bit more about more complex examples, branched examples. Most of the molecules you have to deal with in your subjects are way more complicated than what I just did. So we can look at this now as, let's say, the observer. And over the weekend, I would like you to have a go at getting your head around this. What's missing from that picture that might help? I have a wedge and I have two straight lines. What's missing? A dash. And what is at the end of that dash? A hydrogen. Maybe that helps. If you have the molecules or the models in front of you, you can turn them in space and see this. If not, you have to get used to it very quickly. If I look at this, what direction, if I'm looking from this angle, what direction is that methyl group? Is it to my right or my left? It's to my right. It has to be to your right. If you don't see it's to your right, we need to talk. Because chapter 5, when we come back, which is getting into the difficult stuff, is all about that. It's all about three-dimensional space. If you don't see this, ask. 
If you sit there and you don't ask, good luck. We've got this group to the right. So when I draw this Newman depiction, what's happening here is I'm looking at this down the back here to that bond, to that carbon. What group is that? What's the name of that group? Ethyl, two carbons. That's what this is at the top. Why is it at the top? Because it's above my line of sight. Then I look at the right-hand side, which is where my methyl group is. There's my methyl group. On the left, I have a hydrogen. On the left, I have a hydrogen. Now, looking at this picture, what group is this at the other end? That's also an ethyl. What's its orientation to the other ethyl? Is it anti or gauche or eclipsed? What is it? It's anti. It's on the opposite side. This one is pointing up. This one is pointing down. They are anti. We've got the ethyl group at the bottom. Now, I would prefer this. If the book gives you this. I want this. I want to make sure you know what these groups are so that we can go forward. Same thing here, abbreviations, and we have a branched alkane, shown as a Newman depiction. And then we can talk about the relative orientations of these things. At the bottom, all we have is different Newman depictions for that molecule. And you can start making comments about this pretty quickly. What about this one, good or bad? It's OK, right? If I start to bring an ethyl group close to an ethyl group, Better or worse? Maybe it's worse. Down here, I've got an ethyl and a methyl. Methyl is smaller than ethyl, so this maybe is OK. This is now big and against big. That's worse. Over here, ethyl versus ethyl. What's the relationship between these two? Energetically. Are they the same or different? They are different, because over here, we had ethyl next to ethyl, and methyl was out on its own. Here, we have ethyl and ethyl and methyl. I have an interaction there, which is gauche, and an interaction there, which is gauche. My intention today is to wake you up, is to get you ready for Monday. I've got two classes to get through the cycle stuff, which is way more difficult than this. So we're going to spend the weekend practicing. Over here, is this eclipsed or staggered? That's eclipsed, right? I have ethyl over H, ethyl over H, methyl over H. Is that OK? I mean, that's not bad, is it? You've got big groups over small groups. Now, what about this over here? Yuck, don't like that one at all, all right? Uh, what about this one here? Good, bad, or ugly? That's OK. Uh, it's, not, it's not good, it's bad. Uh, is it as bad as the one before it? No, because I have an ethyl over a methyl. It's very logical, unless you <laughs> slack and don't get to it. So I'm done for the day. I want to mention that my office is open this afternoon to get some help. I want to mention that next week you have four days, and I'm really busy, so don't leave it to the last minute. <laughs>